Hello, my name is Jason Kendall and welcome to our second lecture on astronomy, which is going to be a lot of fun. We've got lots of things to talk about. Well, today what we're going to be talking about is the orbit of the Earth. The Earth's orbit around the Sun and the rotation on its axis are some of the fu most fundamental aspects of astronomy. It was one of the greatest puzzles of all time, and trying to understand the motions of the stars with respect to the Earth has been a great puzzle for most of humanity. So I'm just going to go blow through it with a, as though it's settled science, which it is. So the orbit of the Earth is effectively divided up into two basic pieces. The orbit of the Earth around the Sun and the er rotation of the Earth on its axis. We call the rotation on the Earth on its axis the solar day and it takes 24 hours by definition for the Sun to come back to the same place in the sky and that's what we call the solar day and that's high noon to high noon or midnight to midnight typically we think of high noon because that's when we the Sun is look when it looks due when we look due south it's directly on what we call the meridian and the meridian is an imaginary line that goes from due south to straight overhead at the zenith through due north. And so when the sun passes that, typically at noon, we're a little bit off there for because of the equation of time, which I won't get into, but that's pretty much the definition. When it gets back to noon at that time, that is the definition of the solar day. Well, well, there's another thing that we can call this, it's the diurnal motion, and diurnal means two types of changes. So the diurnal motion of the rotation of the Earth on its axis produces day, and night. So there's two things, diurnal, that they were, that's what we call the diurnal motion. Well, as the Earth rotates on its axis, we also know that it goes around the Sun on its orbit. So Earth and the, if the Sun's here and the Earth is there, as it goes around here, we have the Earth rotating on its axis as it goes. So the exact location of the Sun in the sky changes with time. And so what we'll find is that if we plotted the exact position of the Sun in the sky with respect to all the background stars, we find that the Sun appears to be changing its position. Well, it's because as the Earth goes around the Sun, the stars that are up at midnight are different ones. So the Sun is apparently in front of other stars. We can't see that, but we can infer it because we know where the Sun rises and where the Sun sets, and we can see the stars right before sunrise or the stars right after sunset, and we can determine roughly in the sky where the Sun is. And then we can establish that. And what we call that path that the Sun seems to make with, the back, with respect to the background stars, we call that path the ecliptic. And so it's a definition of where the sun goes in the sky. Well, as the sun travels around the sky, this is an Earth-centered view, we can look at the Earth sun traveling around the sky, or equivalently, as the Earth travels around the sun, we find that as the Earth rotates on its axis, as the Earth moves, it rotates a little bit further. So there's two definitions of the day. There's the normal solar day, which is noon to noon, and then there's a different day, and we'll call that the sidereal day, or the day with respect to the stars. So if instead we look up at night and trace when a particular star crosses the meridian, we'll find that the sidereal day is actually shorter than the solar day. The sidereal day is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and about 4 seconds. So that means what's happened is, is that the, why does the solar day and the sidereal day differ? It's because the Earth moves a little bit. So as this, if this is the Sun and this is the Earth, as it rotates around on its axis, it changes. So it'll change a little bit to here. And if we think of this is where the direction of the Sun is, at 24 hours, 23 hours and 56 minutes later, the Earth has moved a little bit in its orbit. And so the stars that are in the background, way over here, those stars are in the same position. But now we've got to go a little bit further in order to get the Sun in the same position in the sky. So therefore, the sidereal day is shorter than the solar day by about four minutes, because the Sun goes around the sky roughly one degree a day, because there's 365 days in a year and 360 degrees in a circle. Circle, so it goes roughly one extra degree, so it has to move that degree. Anyway, so those are our two definitions, and they're kind of important to remember, because if you want to watch things in the sky, there's two ways to do it. You can either wait for the sun, or if you want to take pictures of things, you want to look at them in terms of their sidereal time, which is when do they rise and set. Okay, so those are our two basic motions as a result of the Earth going around the sun. 
But there's this other thing that people keep talking about, which are the seasons. You know, we have climate change, but seasonal changes are things that we see more frequently. So what are the reasons for the seasons? And as we watch the sun go around the Earth, or more specifically, as the Earth goes around the sun, we see some interesting effects. In the wintertime, in the northern hemisphere on Earth, the sun appears low in the sky at noon. And in the summertime, it appears high in the sky at noon. And that's because the Earth's a a rotation axis is not the same as its orbital axis. So once again, we can think of the Earth going around the Sun like this, and so it makes like a disk, it makes like a plane, and we can make a a, an arrow going out of it. Think of an old photograph or an old disk, a disk with a spindle going through it, and the spindle is the axis for the disk, or even a top, if you will. So the disk of the plane of the Earth going around the Sun has an axis, and then the rotation of the Earth's axis is tilted. So as the Earth goes around, here's the axis for the orbit, the axis for the tilt stays fixed. Just like a top, the top's orbital, uh, the top spinning axis always stays up. That's why a top doesn't fall down. So as you spin a top, it doesn't fall down. So as the Earth goes around the Sun, the orbit, this rotation axis always stays pointed in the same direction. And uh, then the, but the width is different by 23 and a half degrees from the orbital axis. So that is the beginning for the explanation for the reason for the seasons. And really what we can think of is that at the times of summertime, if the sun is here and the earth is here, the earth's axis is pointed towards the sun. Now in the wintertime, the earth's axis is pointed away from the sun. So what does that matter? That matters because is in the summertime, the sun is high overhead, and so the light from the sun doesn't get spread out as much on the surface of the Earth in the Northern Hemisphere. But in the wintertime, the same amount of sunlight gets spread out over a larger area because the sun is at a lower angle in the sky. So the sun's light is spread out over a greater area, so it doesn't receive as much sunlight per square meter on the surface of the Earth. So therefore, this, in the wintertime, it's cooler. And in the summertime, it's warmer because the solar radiation, all of it falls onto a smaller area. So the, the per, per unit area. So it doesn't get spread out as much. If it's straight overhead, it gets spread out hardly at all. All right, so the reasons for the seasons, therefore, are in the wintertime, the, the total amount of energy received by the, total, the northern hemisphere is less than that in the summertime. So there's more energy, more light. First of all, the days are longer. Oh wait, how's that working? The days are longer and the, li the light is more intense, so therefore it can stay warmer in the summer. In the wintertime, the days are shorter and the light is spread out so it never gets the chance to get as much light, and so therefore it's cooler in the wintertime. And of course, in the southern hemisphere, everything is flipped. So the, what we think of then is say, okay, let's relate these two things. The first thing is, remember the path that the sun seems to make in the sky, we call that the ecliptic. That's the same as if the sun, if the earth is going around the sun or the sun is going around the earth, we can pretend either way. But the path that the sun appears to make with respect to the background stars is called the ecliptic. However, that's not the same thing as the path that something appears to take if it's on the celestial equator. The celestial equator is the earth's equator projected out into space. So, the tilt of the Earth's axis means that the celestial equator is not the same thing as the ecliptic, and they intersect at only two points. And we call those points the equinoxes. So the four points that we always remember, we say the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox, there's the summer solstice, and then there's the winter solstice. So here's the idea, is that when the Earth is in the summertime, the sun is above the, uh, the is, is above the celestial equator by 23 degrees, and when it's in winter time, it's below the celestial equator by 23 degrees, and at the equinoxes, it is exactly on the celestial equator. So we call it, as it travels around, we call the vernal equinox the beginning of the, of, well, it seems to be, it's a natural place to think of the beginning of the year. Um, and in fact, astronomically, it's kind of the way we think about it as the beginning of a year because that's where two orbit, to, uh, that's where a, the, in, well, it's a very important point because it gives us the reference point between the ecliptic and the celestial equator. Okay, so 
The seasons, therefore, are caused not by the distance between the Earth and the Sun, but because of the angle of the tilt of the Sun. The distance of the Earth and the Sun is, actually doesn't change that much because the Earth's orbit around the Sun is almost perfectly circular. And in fact, during the Northern Hemisphere winter, we're closer to the Sun by a lot, by a considerable amount of distance compared to the summer. So, if it was a distance problem, then we would always see that the winter would be, clo would be hotter. Now, this doesn't, I mean, if we were in the orbit of Mercury all of a sudden, yeah, it would be hot. And if we were out by Mars, yeah, it'd be cold. But the, sun, the Earth's orbit is almost perfectly circular, so the dominant effect of the seasons is as a result of simply the tilt of the Earth's axis. Okay, so the next thing to think about is, okay, we, we can talk about the year then. I kind of alluded to it. What is a year? A year is season to season, and we call that the tropical year. It goes from, say, we can call, we, we uh, the Western culture, we say January 1st to January 1st. We could use vernal equinox to vernal equinox or summer solstice to summer solstice. All of those points are what we would call a tropical year. Um, but we could also define it with respect to the sidereal year. Now, a sidereal year is when the sun gets back to the same place in the sky with respect to the stars as it did a year ago. So the funny thing is, is that might not sound like it's a difference because all things being equal, all things being equal, they should be the same, but they're not. In fact, the sidereal year is about 20 minutes longer than the, the tropical year. And the reason for that is because, yes, the Earth's spinning, but the Earth, just like a top, precesses. So no, remember when you take a top and you spin it on a table. After it first starts off nice and steady, it looks really cool, it's a lot of fun. If you have a really good top, it'll spin for a long period of time. But eventually the top slows down. And as the top slows down, the top of the top starts to make a circle and starts to go lower and lower and lower. And it's not just rotating on the spin axis, but now the spin at the direction of the spin axis is changing. That motion that we call pre precession. And so precession also happens to the Earth as well. So the Earth's or spin axis changes with respect to time. Now, in a human's lifetime, you're not going to see too much of a change because the time it takes for the Earth's or our orbital spin axis, the Earth's spin axis to change, is about 26,000 years. It takes a long time for it to make one full spin. That's a long time to wait. But if we think about it, that makes a really interesting set of analogies and throughout human history. Because 5,000 years ago, right about the time that Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, were creating mummification, the North Star was not Polaris. Polaris sits today, roughly today, at the North Celestial Pole, which is the extension of the Earth's rotational axis out into space. So if you were to be at the North Pole, lay on your back, look straight up, you would see all the stars going around you in the course of 24 hours with the North Star, Polaris, or Alpha Ursa Minor, straight overhead. Now, if you go back 5,000 years ago, at the height of the ancient Egyptian civilization, when, they're, when they were beginning the mummification process for their pharaohs, that star was Thuban in the constellation Draco. It was not the North Star, because the precession had not yet brought it to Polaris. And if we go back even further, say about 10,000 years ago, or 12,000 years ago, the first the first inklings of the domestication of cattle, the founding of Jericho happened about 12,000 years ago, roughly speaking. So when we look at it, the, well, that time, the North Star was the star Vega in the constellation Lyra, clear across the sky, a huge angular difference of about 46 degrees across the sky. That's a big, big, big angular difference. But that was 12,000 years ago. So therefore, if we were to go to sleep today and wake up in 12,000 years, the North Star would again be Vega. So that's kind of cool, but it takes a long time for that precession to occur. Now there's also little tiny wobbles that are associated with that as well. It, it's not a perfect circle because the Earth has a moon, and that actually takes it around a little bit, but that's kind of the summary of the Earth's motions. So the Earth's motions are, are kind of complete here, and we could talk about them in the following. 
We've got the sun apparently going around the sky on what we call the ecliptic. We've got the earth, the extension of the equator out into the sky, and we call that the celestial equator. And because of the tilt of the earth, the celestial equator and the ecliptic only intersect at two places, the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. So as the sun, as, it, as the earth goes around the sun in a given year, the Earth's, Earth's uh, axis of rotation points only in one direction, and so therefore the seasons are caused by the directness of the sunlight on the surface of the Earth in that hemisphere. And, of course, precession occurs, and that's been part of human history. In fact, if you go way back and look at ancient Egypt and go to the, uh, go to the museum, of, uh, go to the Met over in New York City, you'll find that the ancient Egyptians actually made the, 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 uh, the Great Pyramids. There's a hole in one of them that if you were in the center of the pyramid looking out through this hole 5,000 years ago, you would see the star Thuban. Today, you don't see the star Thuban, but back then, the engineers of the Great Pyramids made sure that the pharaoh would always look at that thing, even as he was mummified and created, uh, deified as a god. So astronomy has had a big impact over time, and these are some of the major impacts, and those are some of the orbits of the Earth and some of its motions. We'll see you next time.